It was mentioned earlier that sometimes you even disagree with yourself. <laughs> Have you ever changed your yes. religious beliefs? Amen. Yes. Amen. Well, have you ever heard of the man that was marooned on an island? <laughs> he was there all by himself. He was there for about 20 years. No one else around. And finally, a ship came by. The captain of the ship got off, came on the island, met this man, talking to him, and the captain met. Uh, the captain saw three buildings. <laughs> So he asked this man, what is that first building? He says, that's where I live. Well, what is this second building? He said, that's where I go to church. He says, well, what's this third building? Well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, my message today is why I believe in the Anglo-Israel message. Now this message is an all-encompassing message. I realize that we have all come from different backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and we heard personal salvation over and over and over, and thank God for personal salvation. Amen. And we've heard it to the extent where apparently that's all that the churches of the uh, most ministers talk about. Yeah. But they neglect the national message of Scripture. Amen. And this message is in the book from cover to cover. Amen. And it, it encompasses every doctrine of Scripture. And we must as believers in the Israel message, form an apologetics for this message. Right. Amen. That doesn't mean an apology. Right. It Amen. means a defense Amen. for this message. Because, you see, we are facing some hurdles. Many hurdles. Number one is ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bible ignorance. Yes. We are living in a day when, it's, when it is now necessary to Christianize Christians. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm sorry. Yeah. Number two, we are facing a two-headed monster mm. called dispensationalism and Zionism. Amen. It's a creeping crud that has yes. entered our churches, yes. entered our Bible colleges and seminaries, yeah. And it is taking over the evangelical fundamental church. Amen. And the third hurdle is a distorted view of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm often reminded of that saying by Mark Guy Pierce. Mm -hmm. He was a British Methodist minister who believed this message. And he said, if we could only rescue the personality of Jesus Christ from organized religion, the people would flock to him again as in the days of old. Amen. 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 But we have a distorted view of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. He's nothing but a Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's nothing but a, a do-gooder that comes around hugging old women and patting babies and you know, kissing babies and handing out Christmas and Easter uh, lollipops. Yeah. Yeah. We we made we we have actually True. brought Jesus down Amen. to our human level Amen. and made him acceptable to any form of thought and belief or any group that may come along and, and claim him. Yes. Amen. But Jesus Christ <coughs> is our God. Amen. 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 We believe that he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Yes. And folks, he's not coming again to take sides. He's coming again to take over. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory. Well, <laughs> let me give you five reasons, five personal reasons why I believe in this message. Number one, I received this message by divine revelation when I was 17 years old. Amen. I didn't know what to do with it. 
I mentioned it to somebody and they scorned it. So I kind of went into a shell, but I received it directly from heaven. Thank God. Amen. Number two, I see it in the scriptures. Yes. Cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Number three, I see it in history. Yes. Number four, I'm compelled to believe it by the Spirit of God. Yes. I cannot get away from it. Every time I pick up this blessed book, mm -hmm. I see the plan and the purpose of Almighty God for our people. Amen. Amen. And number five, my heart is fixed. My mind is made up. I made my declaration when I was 32 years old before the superintendent and talk to him quite a while. And I set the tone of that conversation with three subjects. The Jews are not Israel. Interracial marriage is against nature and against the law of God. Amen. And the Anglo-Saxon people are the covenant people of God. Amen. Praise God! And he looked at me and he said these very words. We no longer have need for your service. Yes. <laughs> Verbatim. And they showed me the denominational one-way exit door. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've heard the phrase, been there, done that, got a t-shirt. <laughs> well, I've been down the, the rejection valley. Amen. Been there, done there, but I didn't get a t-shirt. I got a full suit of clothes <laughs> and an overcoat on top of that. Because they didn't want to see me again. But 39 years later, Amen. Folks, that same denomination, the Assemblies of God, approached me. Amen. 39 years Amen. Later. Yes. Thank God. And said, we would like to have an Anglo-Israel library in our theological seminary. Yes. It's there. Yes. Amen. It's only about 45 miles from where we're sitting. <laughs> and it's called the George W. Southwick yes. Angle Israel Library. Hallelujah. There are hundreds of lives in that. Amen. 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 So God does work in mysterious ways. <laughs> they called me. <laughs> and it was on their nipple. Yep. Thank God. Amen. Well, Brother George Southwick told me one time, he said, the two greatest scriptures in the Old Testament, one of them is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and verse 9. It says, for the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Hallelujah. What is the inheritance of the Lord? It's his people. Yes. yes. And then in Isaiah... It says that the Lord sent a word mm -hmm. unto Jacob and it lighted upon Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that lighting, he sent it to Jacob, but it never flourished, never came to fruition. It never came to completion and to blossom except in Israel, the 12 tribes. Amen. And their calling, their covenants, and their characteristics. Now, I'd like to give you a list. It's only a partial list of biblical reasons why I believe in the Anglo-Israel message and why the covenant nations need this message. Now, Principal George Jeffries, a man, an evangelist of Great Britain, known as the greatest preacher of Britain since the days of John Wesley, he gave us three options. 
He said, is it number one, Jewish Israel? He discounted that. Church Israel, he discounted that. And he said, the only message that makes any sense is the Anglo-Israel message. Amen. Amen. So we have three views. <coughs> we accept, I accept the third. Ordinarily, there's, it's taught that there's five different areas of theology. There's theology, anthropology, soteriology, eschatology, and pneumatology. I have, I'm not too smart, but after watching television, preachers, I know I'm not the dumbest. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but all five areas of systematic theology is only correctly interpreted in the light of the Anglo-Israel message. Amen. <clears throat> number one, reason number one. This message is compatible with the whole context of Scripture. True. It involves monotheism, election, law, and messianic hope. Yes. Now, I'm just hitting the high tops. I mean just the very oh, tips yeah. of the mountains. Right. Because if, if we went into full explanation, brother, we'd be here until the cows come home. <laughs> it says monotheism, election, law, and messianic hope. Mm -hmm. It clearly gives a message of God's person, God's people, God's plan, and God's purpose. It talks about the race of Adam, Noah, Abraham, and the family of God coming all the way down to you and to me. Reason number two. It fits the providential worldview of history. Amen. Now there are different views of history. There's the cyclical view, which means that history just goes around and around and around with no purpose. Then there's the Marxist view, that man is just an animal to serve the state. Then there's the existential or open-ended view, history just goes on and on and on and there's never any climax. There's no purpose to it. That's nihilism. No absolutes. But the Christian biblical view is that God is a governor among the nations. Amen. He sets up kings and he sets down kings. That's right. He puts them down. He puts them up and he puts them down. And when we study the historical approach of prophecy, we see that God controls the historical events ever since the day of Pentecost to now. Because he has a plan and a purpose and he's leading towards the consummation of that plan in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Amen. When we see that holy city coming out of, from heaven, yes. from God out of heaven. And we're part of that city. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number three, it gives proper biblical perspective for missionary zeal. Amen. I realize you may disagree with but I realize that there have been indigenous benefits to missionary work around the world. Yeah. To the darker races. I admit that. But without a proper biblical perspective, mm -hmm. it has brought unutterable devastation yes. upon our race. Yes, it has. Am I denying them the good news of the gospel? No, I'm not. But it has not been given, to my knowledge, it has not been given in a proper biblical perspective because it, in many cases, has brought detrimental results. Amen. Amen. And we are going to suffer. Mm -hmm. We're in, in, in our own chagrin. Someday we're going to look back and say, what did we do? Yes, Amen. sir. Amen. Number four. 
It verifies the authenticity and the infallibility of the Bible. Let me read you something that Charles Bradlaugh said. Now, Charles Bradlaugh was a humanist. Right along with his friend George Oliok, Thomas Paine, Robert Ingersoll, this is what Charles Bradlaugh wrote. He was an Englishman. Quote, God a God of truth? Why his promise? He promised Abraham in the most solemn words. He repeated his promise. Nay, this book which reveals the attitude of Almighty God tells us that God did condescended to swear to a weak, puny man that he would establish his kingdom forever and that his seed should be as numerous as the sand upon the seashore. That promise was reiterated and sworn by God. And I ask, where is that kingdom today? Where? Don't tell me that it is meant figuratively. Don't tell me that it is not literal. God swore that it should be forever. He established it, and now it is a thing of the past. And you tell me that God of the Bible speaks the truth? Wow. He was looking in the wrong places. Sure was. <clears throat> Because the preachers had told him Amen. that that kingdom and that people yes. were the Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah. If he would have looked at the British Empire mm -hmm. and North America and, North, and Northwestern man, mm -hmm. he would have seen that kingdom. Amen. Amen. There are... A man wrote a book. Titled Britain in America, the, the Lost Israelites. Peter McKellar. And he gave six basic deductive concepts. Number one, God who never misstates has made certain promises relating to the house of Israel which were never realized by them in the Holy Land. Number two, God being true, adjust the air these promises must have fulfillment in Israel, therefore Israel must be in existence. Yeah. Number three, the Anglo-Saxon race, in a remarkable manner and a hundred ways, exactly corresponds with the God-given description of what Israel was to become. Yes. Number four, archaeology and history, gives evidence of the more sure word of prophecy. In other words, prophecy being fulfilled in history. Number five, the unauthorized use of the word Israel brings reproach on God's word. Amen. Wow. How true to that. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Number six, substitution does not constitute fulfillment. Amen. The attempt to substitute church for nation is at best a subterfuge and utterly untenable. How true. Right. I move on. This message fits the Western Protestant biblical progressive revelation of truth. Yes. Consider Johann Huss mm -hmm. and the Bohemians. Yes. John Wycliffe and the Lawlers. <laughs> Johann Gutenberg Amen. and the printing press. Amen. Martin Luther. William Tyndale. The King James Bible. Amen. Amen. Where did it happen? 
Did it happen in the east? No. Did it happen in the frozen north? No. No. Did it happen in the human south? No. It happened among our people. Yes. If that makes any sense at all, I mean, anybody with a half a brain, one eye, and one good ear should understand that all those promises of God and the revelation of progressive truth happen with the Anglo-Saxon Germanic people. Amen. Amen. Number six. This is the only message that gives meaning and proves providence in Western European history. Consider the Christian foundations of Great Britain. What does Glastonbury mean? Mm -hmm. What does the trip of Joseph of Arimathea mean? Yes. Did it happen? Is it legend? Yes. No, I've been there. I've talked to the curator or the president of the Glastonbury Preservation Society. He said, yes, Jesus Christ was right here on this land. Amen. Yes. I've talked to him. <laughs> This message gives meaning to the late establishment historical date of America. Amen. Yes. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Amen. The birthright of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> what did Moses say? Mm -hmm. That with the two horns of the unicorn, Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, they're going to push the people together to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth, folks, is California. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's Hallelujah. Right. In more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> the promise was a land of milk and honey. Yes. Yes. And it wound up to be fruits and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. It blends Old Testament and New Testament theology. It's the only message that gives proper understanding to the covenants of God. Amen. Absolutely. And I hear modern preachers, I mean big shots, rich men, <laughs> they got the alphabet behind their name. Yeah. <laughs> and they abuse the covenants of God. They do. And something in me just wants to <laughs> ball up my fist. <laughs> Amen, brother. And go to fighting. Because when you abuse the covenants of God, you abuse the nature, the attributes, and the characteristics of the Almighty. That's right. Yes. Because the covenants are based upon His nature. Amen. Don't change His nature. Amen. When He said, you only, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when He said, you only, of all the families of the earth, yeah. That's exactly what he meant. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Number eight. It explains history and the destiny of the two houses. The broken brotherhood of Zechariah 11. The one shepherd, the two sticks of Ezekiel 37. The other sheep of John 10. The reuniting in Christian covenant under Christ of Ephesians chapter 2. The two baskets of figs of Jeremiah 24, the, the potter house prophecy of Jeremiah 18, and the parables of Matthew 13. Number nine, it's the only viewpoint that guarantees the perpetuity of the house of Israel. It's the only message. And in conjunction with that, number ten, it's the only message that guarantees the perpetuity of the Davidic family and covenant. Amen. And throne. God gave David ten things. He gave him a horn, a root, a city, a house, a covenant, a throne, a key, a tabernacle, a kingdom, and a greater son. Hallelujah. Wow. That's ten sermons. We could be here till 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave us seven solaric witnesses. What are they? Heaven and earth, day and night, sun, moon, and stars. Yep. The 
The solar system is still working. Amen. Amen. And he said as long as that solar system is working, Israel and the covenant and the throne of David will be in the earth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who else preaches that? <laughs> That's in our hands, folks. Yes. Yes. That Amen. should be on our tongue. Yes. Yes. That should be our passion. Amen. Amen. That God swear, and He swear by Himself because He can find no greater. That's right. And He swear to two things. Mm -hmm. He swear to the Abrahamic covenant yep. and the order of Melchizedek. Yep. He said, "These two things shall always be." Amen. And the the uh, Abrahamic covenant <coughs> is unconditional. Yes. <laughs> it's immutable. Uh -huh. It's irrevocable. It's everlasting. And it's unilateral. Yes. I wish some of these preachers on TV would put that in their pipe and smoke it. Yeah, don't okay. Okay. <laughs> what else are smoking? <laughs> yeah. Well, number eleven. It explains the dele the delegated landmass of habitation for each respective racial group. Yes. What does Genesis, say, uh, Genesis 10 say? When he divided the nations. <laughs> when he divided the sons of Noah. That's God's doings. Sure is. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. when he set the boundaries of the nations, it says when God divided the nations, He set the boundaries of the nations according to the tribes of Israel. Amen. Even that Edomite prophet, <laughs> Balaam, who prophesied with his eyes wide open, mm -hmm. said this, Israel shall dwell alone Amen. and Amen. not be reckoned among the nations. Hallelujah. Amen. It was God's intent for us to dwell alone. Amen. God has protected us before. Amen. From the tell of the Hun mm -hmm. in 451. He protected northwestern Europe from the Muslim Moors mm -hmm. at 732. Thank God for Charles the Hammer. Yes. Also, he protected our race from Genghis Khan. He can do it again. Amen. Yes. Yes. Number 13. This is the only Christian prophetic message that allows the law and the prophets to dictate both our personal and national life. Yes. You see, the kingdom and the church go together. Yes. The kingdom is the greater circle, mm -hmm. and the body of Christ is that inner circle within the kingdom. Amen. And the kingdom, according to Scripture, should be the physical guardian of the church, and the church is the spiritual guardian Amen. of the kingdom. Amen. But we have lost our voice. Yes. The prophet's chair in the church house is empty. Amen. Yes. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. The prophetic voice in the pulpit of America is silent. Yes. Yes, yes sir. <clears throat> Number 14 is the only message of hope for the restoration of national integrity. It would solve our homosexual agenda problem. Oh, yes. It would solve our zoo that is taking place up in Washington right now. Yeah. It would, it would stop abortion. Amen. It would solve our racial problem. Yep. It would solve our crime problem. Yep. And it would solve our penal problem oh, in this country. Yes. And our health problem. Amen. Amen. Number 15. It's the only message to stand in biblical defense of monotheism Amen. and against multi-religious society. Yes. When the Lord spoke to Israel and He said... <laughs> Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's so difficult about that? Really? 
<laughs> the thou shalt and the thou shalt not of God. That's their great language. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And somehow, through religious manipulation, we can get around that. But it still stands. Amen. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And another way of saying that is thou shalt not put any other god before my face. That's right. Amen. And what are we doing in this nation? Yeah. There's every a mosque day. there. Every day. There's a Hindu temple over here. Yep. Sticking them in the face of the Almighty God. What an insult. Yeah. And some of our preachers, I mean the big money guys throughout this nation, give sanction. Yeah. Pre give sanction. They celebrate to multi-religious faith. We're going to come together someday. Yeah, you will come together all right with a knife in his back. Yeah. Well, let me move on. <laughs> this is the only message that explains historical spiritual revivals. I don't have time to read all these verses. But in Isaiah chapter 59, he says, Isaiah, my covenant that I make with them, I will put my word in their mouth and I will put my spirit in them Amen. from henceforth and forever. Hallelujah. And in Isaiah 44, he says, I will pour out water upon a dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon <laughs> thy seed. What about the great revivals of Britain? What about the Welsh revival of 1904? Amen. What about the uh, revival of 1800 in Britain with Christmas Evans and the, the uh, Fulton Street revival in this country? The first and second great awakening in this yes. country. Is it all accidental? No. What about the revival that took place in the Confederate Army when 150,000 yeah. southern soldier boys were converted to Christ Amen. and went back and started churches all through the countryside. Amen. Was it by accident? No. 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 <laughs> it was by the divine providence. Right. Don't forget 1776. <laughs> Number 17. It allows Jesus to fulfill his biblical role as prophet to Israel. Yes. He is the Word made flesh. High priest for Israel mm -hmm. and king over Israel. <laughs> Number 18. This message explains the relationship of Christ the shepherd and his sheep. In Psalm 22, 23, and 24, we have the picture of a dying lamb a dying shepherd a risen shepherd and a reigning shepherd Amen. You see Jesus is the good shepherd he said I give my life for the sheep Peter calls him the great shepherd that rose from the dead and he's the chief shepherd who soon shall appear. Amen. And reign over the house of Jacob. Hallelujah. Even so come. Amen. That was the angelic promise to Mary. Amen. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Amen. And of his kingdom there no. shall be no, no end. end. Number 19. It's the only perspective that gives proper biblical recognition to the person and ministry of Jesus Christ and his accomplish, accomplishment on the cross. What did he die for? I grew up with the understanding he died for me. That's true. Atonement. What about redemption? 
Not just personal redemption, but national redemption. What about he died to ratify the new covenant? He told his disciples, drink this cup. Yes. This is my blood of the new covenant. Hallelujah. He died to ratify a new covenant yes. with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Same thing. Reconciliation all through the New Testament. Yes. What about the adoption of sons? That's in his death. What about the grafting in of the olive tree? That was in his death. Number 20. This message gives clarity to the concept of heaven, which is the future literal kingdom of God in completion. Yes. Ordinarily, it's flying around up there somewhere on another planet, drinking lemonade, eating cotton candy, <laughs> putting your feet in the river of life and plucking fruit off of a tree. Symbolic language. Yes. Every bit of it has to do with the house of Israel. Amen. In Revelation 21, 22, who's the bride? Who's the bridegroom? Mm -hmm. New Jerusalem. The city's four square. The tree of life. The stones. Mm -hmm. The gates and the names over the gates of Amen. New Jerusalem. Amen. What are the names? Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve tribes, Tri 12 tribes of Israel. <coughs> Twenty-one. It's the only mes message that has credible witness from some of the most erudite scholars that's ever lived. British ministers, statesmen, mm -hmm. military men, J.H. Allen, yeah. C.R. Dickey, F.F. F. Bosworth, mm -hmm. John Alexander Dowie, mm -hmm. George Jeffries, Mordecai Ham, Luke Rader, and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. Also, what is the nature of the enemies of this message? Ignorant? Rebellious, mm -hmm. comfortable, mm -hmm. and the satanic. Yeah. This message brings <coughs> biblical clarity Amen. to a believer's understanding of Scripture. Yeah. Right now in modern fundamentalism, evangelicalism, especially in the charismatic movement, I mean, people are running around, they're biting on everything. It's just like a blind dog in a butcher shop. <laughs> just anything they sniff, they'll bite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's because they don't have biblical clarity. Amen. When God opens the eyes of our people, and He's going to do it someday. Praise God. This will be bigger than the Protestant Reformation. Amen. Amen. And that absolutely changed history. Sure did. And but this will change it again. Amen. This will alter our culture. Amen. It will bring the law of God into prominence. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ will reign on this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. Praise God. It will bring national repentance. Amen. We see the verse, we read the verse, if my people which are called by my name, Amen. we know what that means. Amen. Yes. My people. It will also give a proper role and responsibility of the church 
as the body of Christ to be masculine yes. instead of being a feminized, yes. emasculated body of people. Amen. Folks, we haven't been heard because Jesus said that there's somebody standing in the door and will not go in and will not let others go in. That's true. And the modern evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever world is standing in the door. It's the preachers yeah. that are standing in the door right. and will not let their people hear. Amen. Amen. God somehow, yeah. some way, sometime in your providence, in your wrath, mm -hmm. remember mercy. Amen. 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 That's just the beginning of the list. <laughs> but we must have an apologetics for what we believe. Amen. Amen. Because God has put it in our understanding yes. and it not in our hands as we interpret this blessed book. Yes, sir. And speak it with our mouth. Amen. God raise up men. Yes. I mean men without fear yes. or favor. Amen. To speak the truth Amen. regardless their paycheck may go down. Yeah. So what? Amen. Right. Their reputation may be in the mud. So was Jeremiah's. Yep. Amen. So was Isaiah's. Mm -hmm. So was Ezekiel's. So was Peter and James and John. That's right. But this message we need the power of the Holy Ghost once infused into this message and to lips that are burning with a fire from off the altar of God. Amen. We don't need any more preachers with prepared...